Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Brian Hornback Experience. Yes, it was called the Brian Hornback Podcast for one episode and one episode only. Episode 59, it was called the Brian Hornback 30. And I just decided that, you know what, <clears throat> it was time for a new name after uh, episode 59. And so with episode 60 going forward, it's the Brian Hornback Experience because, and I, I still promise we're going to keep it to 30 minutes or less, not going to have any long interviews, not going to have any long uh, episodes, but it's the Brian Hornback experience because you never exactly know what you're going to get when Brian Hornback's on the air. But hey, here on episode 20, we got Daniel Watson. He is the Knox County School Board member for District 3. He was elected in 2020. Uh, and um, Daniel has really taken on a, a, a leadership role on the board early on. Uh, and um, he, he comes from he comes from a background of of helping um, helping mothers who are single mothers who are low income, but uh, he represents and he grew up out in Carnes. And uh, so, Daniel, thanks for being on the 60th episode of the Brian Hornback Experience. Thanks, man. I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I do have one small correction. Oh, sorry. I didn't come, I didn't come to Knox County until '97 to go to school. I went to ah. Johnson University, so. I actually grew mm. up, and all, all up and down the East Coast, so that, I'm not a Cars boy. I remember, I remember that now. Now that you remind me of that, uh, I remember that your, 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 you and your mother moved all over the place, uh, and that's so, right. um, so yeah, you came. Uh, that's right. But anyway, you've been here longer than, than most everybody that's been moving here. So hey, well, I'm, car, I'm, I'm sure. I've been here long enough to love it. So. Absolutely, but hey, one the main reason I called Daniel, got a hold of Daniel today, and said, hey. I want to get you on the Brian Hornback experience to talk about something because as, as most everybody knows, and as Daniel knows, I was on the school board two decades ago. I was elected in 2000 and served till 2004. Uh, and uh, obviously being a blogger and now a podcaster, I watch all these, um, fortunately, thanks to, um, thanks to the internet and uh, live streaming, I can watch these things from the comfort of my home or my office I don't have to That's go. Right. I don't have to go sit in a, a, in, a in a meeting. But um, anyway, we'll talk about that on a future episode about the reason that there are cameras in the AJ building in, in the first floor. Diane Dozier, who's now passed away, she and I were sitting in there one day, and she said, "Why are work, our workshops not televised?" And I said, "Well, because we don't meet in the main assembly room." And so uh, Diane Dozier and I, back twenty plus years ago. Um, actually started talking to the school system about putting in cameras. And now, um, now that y'all having to vacate the AJ building, uh, those cameras, I guess I'll have to get moved too, but that's, I'm, I'm very thankful that workshops are televised, but well, the next, the next innovation we need now is for school board members who are sick. Like I was on hmm. Wednesday to be able to join virtually via zoom. I was able to join, but all I could see was Terry's face. And I couldn't hear anything. Oh so wow! We need like a 360 degree camera, and we need two way mics. <laughs> well, you, you're right, and you know, <clears throat> I'm glad that I'm glad that one of my frustrations in watching the board, and we're getting a little off topic here, but one of the frustrations is a couple of your board members really don't like to use the microphone, um, and I'm not going to name names, but um, at least they kept, at least with you being on uh, Zoom Wednesday night, they kept reminding everyone to move to pull their microphone sure. down. So. Yeah. But anyway, so, you know, I watched uh, Monday night and I watched Wednesday night and there was this great discussion about this new policy um, called the equity policy. And obviously there was a lot of discussion Monday night and obviously it looked like on Monday night it was going to get sent to policy review and there was a lot of discussion. And then again, Wednesday night, there was a lot of discussion and it did get sent to policy review. And, you know, I, I was sitting there thinking, I was sitting there a little dumbfounded by it because obviously as, as a, as a government, as a government, um, voyeur of watching these meetings, I know that, that this policy probably, and, and I'm guessing, and you can correct me, I'm guessing that this policy kind of started back in 2007 with the racial disparity in school discipline task force, which they had their fi actually they had their final it started before 2007 because their final report yeah. their final report was March 12th of 2007 there were 11 members on that task force and then that developed into a disparities in education outcomes task force which had yeah. their final report in 
uh, May of 2016, but it was formed in 2014, and it had 36 members on it. And I think you, I think you wound up after you became a board member in 2020. I think you took over chairing something for Evity. Is that what you took over chairing for her? So not chairing, but serving as the board member on that steering committee. So she okay. was the chair. There's two right. community co-chairs. Okay. There's Amar and Toma Battle, but I was the board representative on that committee. Now, is that committee still meeting? It does. So we shifted the name. It's now called the Alliance for Educational Equity, and that steering committee still meets, yes. All right. How often, how often is that? Four okay. The steering committee as a whole meets four times a year. But the planning committee that prepares for the steering committee uh, probably meets around eight times a year. Okay. So, you know, so, so obviously I was looking at that and I watched, I really didn't do much prep until I, I realized today that I was going to get you on this pot, on this experience. And so then I, I get to looking at this policy and I really don't understand. There, there were two board members um, that really did a lot of the talking. Uh, and that was Susan Horn, who actually is my school board representative, which is the district that I served 20 plus years ago, uh, District mm -hmm. 5, and Mike McMillan um, from out in 8th District. Two polar opposites, uh, one's from East Knox County, one's from West Knox County. But uh, Susan Horn really went through um, kind of chewing up this policy and talking about how it, how there's all kinds of other things, other policies that go into it. But and, and, and just to talk about the board members, Mike McMillan was first elected in 2010. Uh, Patty Bounds was elected in 2014. Susan Horn was born in, born, Susan Horn, <laughs> Susan Horn was elected in 2016, along with Jennifer Owen in 2016. So these, right. these four folks should have the most experience in dealing with this because we've been talking about, when I say we, the community sure. and the school board have been talking about these issues for at least that long. And so, you know, Christy, Christy, the chair, and, and Evity Satterfield, the vice chair, and, and Virginia Babb all came on in 2018. And then you and you and Betsy Henderson come on in 2020. So, you know, <clears throat> I'm sitting here watching this discussion and I'm 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 listening to Susan Horn kind of chew it up. And then and then basically she says, and and I hope I'm not paraphrasing, I hope I'm actually quoting her correctly, but obviously uh, the YouTube can tell us different, but she basically said, I don't see a reason to have this equity policy. Right. And, and, and McMillan basically said the same thing. And McMillan's trying to act like there's going to be a lot of money to go with this equity policy. Well, I, I read the equity policy and all the policy standards that, that they're asking for in this policy are found in the Tennessee leaders for equity playbook, which was published in April of 2018, there were 15 people on that group, which included Tammy Grissom, who who presented the right. superintendent finalist at the very same meeting. She's on that. And, and so, there was a 2.0 version that was just published in December 2021. Oh, okay. Okay. So, you know, I mean, everything in this policy, to me, I'm going... I mean, we're talking about, so the seven standards, and, and I'm going to link to all this on a, on a blog post that I'll publish at some point this weekend, this weekend being, sure. being today being February the 11th, but we're talking about decreasing chronic absenteeism. We're talking about reducing disproportionate suspension expulsion rates, increasing student early post-secondary opportunities, providing equitable access to effective teachers, recruiting and retaining a diverse teaching force, embedding cultural awareness in school practices, and partnering with community allies, those those are the things that that this policy asks that the board that 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 the board set as a goal. And I, I just right. so before before I turn it over to you, one, I don't understand what the controversy is. So if if right. if you know that, then you can enlighten us. But let me just say that in my twenty years twenty years ago, when I was on the school board, I I recognized as a kid that was. Grew up all my life in East Knox County. I grew up in Sunnyview and, and graduated from Carter High School. But my wife and I, after we got married in 88 and lived in East Knox County till 92, we moved to the far west in 92. And my kids have all been educated in West Knoxville. But I, I have seen my entire life there is an equity problem in Knox County schools. From when I was a student 
to when my kids have gone through school and graduated. Thankfully, we don't, we, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm past the child rearing years now. Sure. But, but I recognize, I recognize when I became a school board member in 2000 and when we went and looked at Project Grad in 2001, that there was an equity problem in Knox County Schools. And I'm proud to say that I never questioned the investment in Project Grad when I was on the school board. And I'm proud to say that that's one of the things that I'm most proud of in my four years. And when Ebony Satterfield ran for the school board in 2018, and I met with her just because I'm a blogger, and she told me that she was one of the first Project Grad kids, to me that said, mm -hmm. I did the right thing as a school board member. And never, sure. yeah. and, and as a West Knoxville school board member, I could have easily said, well, if we're going to spend all this money at Austin East and Fulton and on, on all these elementary and middle school kids for Project Grad, how are we going to spend that money out in West Knoxville? I never questioned that. And so I knew then that we have an equity problem. And I don't see that the equity problem has been resolved. And just this policy doesn't have anything to say about dollars. So... I want to give my yeah, spill. There's no fiscal note. Right. So I want to give my spill, and then I want to just get your idea of what what you thought about the policy, where you think. We, now, this is going to go March 23rd. This is going to the school board's policy review committee. I'm going to do my very darndest best to be there uh, to watch that in person. But just talk yeah. just talk to us about kind of what you saw in that process and, uh, sure. and what you think going forward. I think it's really important to acknowledge that I can't think of anybody who actually does not want equity for themselves. So the basis of equity says uh, to be equitable means that you meet somebody where they are based upon their uh, aptitudes, their challenges, their circumstances. You meet them where they are in terms of resourcing them to help them get to where they're trying to go. Not that they're trying to all get to the same place, right? So right. Think about that for yourself. There's not any person who does not want equity. And so I agree with you. When you hear the phrase equity in education, my initial reaction is, what's the problem? Like, I don't understand what the challenge is. And so I've had to kind of do some digging and thinking about that, too, based upon these last two experiences. You outlined the long history. Hmm. So the so in Knox County, you know, you referenced you think there's been an equity problem. Well, one of the ways we know that is because of the stark disparities in education. And, and that research is readily available. It's on the Knox County Schools website um, under the Alliance for Educational Equity page. So it's not hard to see that those inequities have led to real disparities among different groups of our students. And so um, one of the things that it's important for people to note, which did not really fully come out in these meetings, is it, it in the meetings it almost sounded like Bob surprised the board with this policy. That's not actually the case. At our um, policy review meeting on November 17th last year, toward the end of that meeting, and I think most of the board members were there. Not every board member makes every policy review, and I can't remember exactly who was there, but most of them were there. Bob said, along with his team, hey, we are going to start working on an equity policy to bring back to the board. Nobody had any concerns, challenges. Why are we doing this now? What's the timing? He was informing the board they were going to work on it. Prior to that, in September, at our retreat, Nathan Langelois, who used to be the uh, principal at AE, who is now our Title IX person, um, did a full presentation for the board about the work of the Alliance for Educational Equity and how we were aligning that work to the Tennessee Leaders for Equity Playbook and ESSA along with the seven commitments that are referenced in this policy. So all of that's being presented to the school board at the retreat, and everybody was at the retreat. Again, everybody's like, that's great, glad we're doing it, no problems, no challenges, right? And so then two months later, Bob says, now we're working toward a policy. In December, he emailed an apparent email. Um, it was not the subject of the email, but one line in the email did reference that we were working on an equity policy. Um, so again, notification again, and then in January, the equity policy comes, and it, that was not recorded. I hate that we do not record those policy review meetings, but in that policy review meeting, the number one thing that people started saying was, this is not the right time for this. We need to have a new superintendent in place and see what they think. Hmm. 
And I don't understand that argument. And here's the reason why I don't understand the argument is we as school board members, we set policy. Now, policy can derive from lots of places, but we're the ones that set policy. And the reason we set policy is because it's the thread across leadership. It's the thread across administrations uh, that keeps our system moving in a certain direction. And what was not mentioned at that meeting is by the time we install the new superintendent, we will basically have three less or three of our board members will no longer be board members or on their way out. And right. he's already said she's not running again. Virginia's not running again. And Patty's not running again. So basically you're saying a new superintendent with a new board should look at this. And to me, that's kicking the can down the road. And, and I don't know why we're abdicating that responsibility when again, the superintendent has prepped us for this. And the main thing this policy does, I think you read it correctly, is it simply states to those who are involved in this work, the Alliance for Educational Equity and other stakeholder groups, including those departments in our um, system, because right now we have six equity teams within the district. So we have one around um, uh, discipline. Um, we have one around school culture. We have one around HR. Um, and we have one around academics. So there's six equity teams. So what this policy is trying to do and the intent of it, the reason why Bob brought it is to say, hey, our our strategic plan, which right now a third of it has to do with eliminating disparities, will expire in 2024. Mm. This the work of that plan around disparities. I can guarantee you by 2024, we will not have eliminated disparities. Right. So what he is saying in this policy is this work beyond the strategic plan should continue. And the way to do that is to codify it in policy and give direction for future administration and staffs. And we thought that I think when I say we, I mean, he, he and his right. team derived the policy. I think they're saying the best way to do that is to align it with the Tennessee Leaders for Equity playbook, which was built by the Department of Education in Tennessee. And like you said, I can't think of anybody who would disagree with those seven things. So. Here now, here's what I think the real issue is, and I'm just going to call it out. I think I, 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 I think I think I think equity. okay, all I, right. I think that there are political spheres, and Mike McMillan said this on Wednesday night. He or no, he said it on Monday night. He said, "Well, depending on who you ask, equity means different things, especially when you think about the national stage." Mm. So I think what's happening is. Because this has the phrase equity in it, it's getting sucked up into a national culture war. And what I would love for Knox County is for us, which this policy attempts to do, is to define what we might mean by educational equity for Knox County schools and and separate ourselves from the noise of everything else that's being discussed. And let's focus on our kids and what's right for our kids at this time. Um, and not get sucked into all that because at the end of the day, I believe that kids are losing out because those disparities that we have the research on, they were not created overnight. They're not going to go away overnight, but it is going to take intentionality. And we can either kick the can down the road and pass it on to the next set of leaders. Um, or we can say, no, this is what we're committed to as a district. And one last point, and then you can ask me any questions. Sure. One of the things, so the State Board of Education last year passed a policy around um, teacher diversity mm. um, at, at a state level at the State Board of Education. So all districts across the state are going to be focused on te- uh, diversifying our teacher workforce. Historically, this is so important because after Brown versus Education, nationally, we lost 38,000 educators of color. So what most people don't realize is, yes, Brown versus Ed. Um, tried to desegregate schools and that, you know, over time that slowly happened, but it did it for students, not for teachers. Teachers of colors lost their jobs. Mm. It, 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 they, did, they didn't desegregate. Well, we're still feeling the effects of that today. And so we need to be really intentional about curving that. There's lots of research that says not just children of color, but all children of color who have a diverse teacher force fare better academically. And so here, here's the here's the problem with this. At right now, Knox County Schools is developing a grow your own program, which means mm-hmm. we're targeting students at 
AE and Bolton and other places, students of color to say, you should consider teaching. And we're going to help you do that. And we're also trying to create a cohort of students um, um, in uh, post-secondary ed who are going to come in and intern and be the next teachers of color. I can guarantee you if Knox County cannot pass a fairly benign equity policy like this one, it will send a message Hmm. to certain groups that says, we hear what you're saying. Yes, you value us and what we can add to your system, but we don't see that in your commitment to policy. Hmm. And and I think there's going to be unintended consequences. I don't think that's an intentional message that would be sent. I do think it would be an unintentional message that's sent. And right. Even to um, different leaders of color and others in our current district, I mean, we have some very highly capable, highly um, respected uh, people that we've uh, brought into the system who I'm sure are looking at what this board does with this policy to decide if this is really the district good for them long term. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think you're, you know, I hadn't really thought about the fact that, that equity is a national code word, but you know, it, it has been frustrating, uh, to see, um, you know, national code words like critical race theory get brought into, into Knox County, uh, which, which has really not been a, a significant problem, um, in, in any education, uh, K through 12. Which is what the Knox County School System do, uh, de, uh, deals with, but also, also, you know, I, I agree with you that you know anybody that spends any time researching education in the state of Tennessee recognizes that when the basic education plan passed in the early '90s, about '92, uh, you know, it's the school board that drives the superintendent, and then the right. superintendent is the CEO. He's the one that then takes whatever the school board says and implements, and he's the one that has to then create that. So, you know, that's a problem. I, you know, I, I do think... Yeah, if we're hiring a superintendent right now, right. we make that decision, they right. should be very clear about what the expectation is. Right. We don't hire them and wait and say, hey, now, what do you think we should do? Not that they shouldn't have input. That, not that they're right. not a partner, but the school board sets the tone and the direction. I mean, right. that's gotta be the way it works the only the only other thing that i picked up on as i looked at the tennessee leaders for equity playbook uh is that one of the 15 people that helped create that happened to be our former superintendent uh who is now the dean of (laughs) dean of education at uh, belmont university that 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 surely would surely surely people wouldn't be so petty as as to not want a policy of equity because Dr. Jim McIntyre happened to be one of 15 along with Phyllis Nichols, Tammy Grissom, and a few other folks across the state that helped create the well, Tennessee and, Leaders for and, Education and Phyllis Playbook. Nichols. So Phyllis Nichols has served on the Disparities in Educational Outcomes Task Force and now the Alliance for Educational Equity for years. Right. It seems like to me those voices and those folks who have been most invested in the work should have some influence about whether or not we have an equity policy and how the equity policy is designed. And I know Rosa Marr was at the meeting to speak on Monday. I think once she um, she didn't end up speaking, she left before public forum. Mm. I'm assuming, I don't know this, Right. I'm assuming that once it we were talking about kicking it back to policy review that she would hold her comments for now. But I know she was there to speak in support of it because she's the co-chair, right? Right. And, and those folks should have some influence in whether or not this is the right thing to do. Well, and, and it's just frustrating. You know, it, it's really – it's something that I haven't really seen much at the school board – but it, but it's something that I see when I'm looking at city council or county commission. You know, we have a tendency to just, you know, put things off, put things off. You know, if a bunch of people show up, we we put things off, and, and then we just want to pass whatever we want to pass when, when nobody's looking. And, and you know, I, I just think that it's important that people understand what's happening. And, again, you know, my biggest frustration in watching what happened Monday night and Wednesday night was, you know, the reference to – it was almost. It was almost as if um, I, I believe it was McMillan that made some comment about, well, how much money we're going to throw at equity, and it was like it was. It was like he was trying to tie the um, city council's reparations 
uh, vote back to the school board. Right. And and well, again they, and again the the, the mis the, the miscommunication on that is the city council doesn't have a reparations line item in their budget. They said that we will work toward obtaining grants to the amount of X dollars right. for that. Right. For that, they never said we're going to spend a hundred million dollars on reparations. Um, right. But anyway, well, and, and also too, whether or not we like it or not, both federal law and state law says that you have to have equity in your education. Right. Uh, at a local at a local level, we don't get a choice whether or not we have equitable education. This policy isn't trying to give us that choice or not. What it's doing is to try to define. What does equity mean for Knox County, and how are we going to go about tackling it? Right. I mean, that's what the policy does. We don't get a choice of whether or not we have equity in education. That's right. a federal and state law. Right. Well, uh, school board member Daniel Watson, thank you for joining me on, on this. Uh, this is the first time I've had you on the podcast, and I appreciate you joining me at somewhat of a short notice. Uh, I reached out to you today, and you're willing to do it, and I appreciate you doing that. And and again, um, you know, I'll, I'll get this up, and then uh, come March 23rd, uh, I have every intent to be there since that meeting is not televised. And uh, we'll, I'll, I'll continue to to watch this benign policy on equity and see if we can't it, see if the school board can't take some type of position on on what they should be doing in the first place. Well, let me let me say this. Yes, sir. I really appreciate you asking me to be a part of it. I appreciate you lifting up this issue and being willing to have these types of conversations. And I love the name, the Orbach Experience. Absolutely. So keep rolling with that. All right. Appreciate you, Daniel. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care. Bye.